Although no description of Tanaman had yet been made public, the McCanns and their group of friends obviously knew of the description. So almost certainly Robert Murat would have known. After all, for several days following Madeline's disappearance, he spent most of the day in the police station translating for a series of witnesses and talking to the police. I raise the possibility, although I am not saying this is true, that Martin Smith may have secretly been informed of Jane Tanner's description of Tanaman, mainly because, as we've seen, the descriptions of Tanaman and Smithman are so strikingly similar. And again, I am not stating these as known facts, only hypothesizing based on what I know. I have asked Martin Smith in emails twice if he would be interviewed by me on camera to clear up these issues. On the first occasion he declined, and on the second, to date, he has not replied. In fact, I am not aware of any interviews the Smiths have given on camera. Earlier I suggested that the descriptions of both Sagresman and Tanaman could have been based on the same source, namely the oddly dressed Wojciech Krakowski. If in turn Smithman was based on Tanaman, then all three descriptions would turn out to be based on Wojciech Krakowski. Let's look at these descriptions. 1. The face. Sagresman, Caucasian with Latin colouring of medium complexion. Tanaman, dark-skinned individual, couldn't see his face. Smithman, difficult to see his face in the dark, didn't appear to have a beard or moustache. 2. The age. Sagresman, between 35 to 40 years of age. Tanaman, aged 35 to 40. Smithman, Martin Smith says 35 to 40. Peter Smith says about 35, maybe older, while Aoife Smith suggests 20 to 30. 3. Height. Sagresman, around 170 to 175 centimetres in height, 5 foot 7 to 5 foot 9. Tanaman, about 1.7 metres tall, 5 foot 7. Smithman, Martin and Peter Smith say he was about 1.75 metres to 1.8 metres tall, 5 foot 9 to 5 foot 11. Aoife Smith says 1.7 to 1.75, 5 foot 7 to 5 foot 9. 4. The hair. Sagresman, curly dark brown hair that ran down to the back of his neck and in a ponytail. Tanaman, very dark, thick hair, longer at the back. Smithman, all the Smiths say his hair was brown and shortish. Ether says his hair colour was light brown, thick and long on top. 5. The jacket. Sagresman, he wore a cream coloured cloth coat stroke jacket of the same material as his trousers. Tanaman, wearing a dark duffy type jacket, but not that thick, a sort of anorak of the same material as his trousers. Smithman, the man was wearing a dark jacket. Martin Smith couldn't remember what top the man was wearing when first questioned, but later remembered that he wore a darkish top. 6. The trousers. Sagresman, he wore cloth trousers of the same material as his jacket. Tanaman, he was wearing linen-type chino-style cloth trousers, beige to golden in colour, like cortisite of the same material as his jacket. Smithman, the man was wearing light-coloured trousers. Aoife Smith says, beige in colour, cotton fabric, thicker than linen. Martin Smith says, he was wearing cream or beige-coloured cloth trousers in a classic cut. 7. The shoes. Sagresman, his shoes, he thinks, were dark brown and of the type that needed to be shined or polished, i.e. leather. In his book, Dr. Conchalo Amaral says they were shoes of a classic type. Tanaman, his shoes were dark in colour, classic type. Smithman, no comments made. 8. The build. Sagresman, no comment made. Tanaman, slim physical appearance. Smithman, the Smiths all say average build, except that Martin Smith says he had an average build a bit on the thin side. 9. Not a tourist. Sagresman, no comment made, but Gonchalo Amaral writes in his book, Chapter 3, The Stranger Did Not Look Like a Tourist. Tanaman, by the way he was dressed, he gave her the impression that he was not a tourist, because he was very warmly dressed. Smithman, the man didn't look like a tourist. The Portuguese police report Martin Smith's evidence on this point as follows. Urged, he states that the individual did not appear to be a tourist. He cannot explain this further. It was simply his perception given the individual's clothing. The three descriptions are not exactly the same, but the similarities are obvious.
Let's look further at mainstream media reports about the Smith Man sighting. In The Sun, 3rd of January 2008, Mary Smith is asked about the claimed sighting and says, we didn't think anything of it. But in another paper, the Daily Mail, on the same day, Martin Smith is quoted as saying that his wife, without warning, approached the man with the question, oh, is she asleep? He is said to have ignored her. Mary Smith declined to make a statement to the police confirming her evidence. Moreover, neither Martin Smith nor his two children, who did make police witness statements, referred to this alleged encounter in their statements. So, did Mary Smith not think anything of it? Or did she approach the man and ask him a question? In the same Daily Mail article, far from not thinking anything of it, Martin Smith is quoted as saying, it was a disturbing encounter. Later, in the same report, we get more details. An Irish holidaymaker has spoken publicly for the first time of his disturbing encounter with a man carrying a child wrapped in a blanket on the night Madeleine McCann disappeared. The sighting is strikingly similar to one by a friend of the McCann's, Jane Tanner. In hindsight, the retired Mr Smith said the man's rude behaviour should have aroused his suspicions. Martin Smith said, the one thing we noted afterwards was that he gave us no greeting. My wife Mary remembered afterwards that she asked him, oh, is she asleep? But he never acknowledged her one way or another. He just put his head down and averted his eyes. This is very unusual in a tourist town at such a quiet time of the year. So Martin Smith described this as a disturbing encounter with a man who behaved rudely and was very unusual. The Mail article continued, Mr Smith said it was some time before the family realised there could be star witnesses. We were out the night it happened. We went home about 9.50pm and we heard nothing at all about Madeleine McCann until the next day. I was taking my son Peter to the airport and on my way back I heard that a kidnapping happened in the village of Luz. We were looking at all the commotion on Sky News and we really felt quite helpless. We had two grandchildren with us at the time, aged four and five, and it had a terrible effect on them. They all wanted to sleep in the same room as us until we went home on the Wednesday. We see contradiction here with Mary Smith's we didn't think anything of it and her husband's he was rude, it was very unusual, disturbing. One odd feature of this Daily Mail report was that the child was wrapped in a blanket. One wonders where that came from, as none of the three Smiths who made statements mentioned a blanket. They all insisted she was dressed only in pyjamas. Here is what three of the Smiths said in their official witness statements. Aoife Smith said that she didn't see the child's face because she was lying vertically against the man's left shoulder. Peter Smith said the girl was asleep, her eyelids were closed. Martin Smith says the man didn't speak, nor did the child, as she was in a deep sleep. Martin Smith said he put his head down. His son Peter, he did not try to hide his face, nor did he lower his gaze. Another issue is how Martin Smith's memory seemed to improve between making his first statement on the 26th of May 2007 and a second one in January 2008. In May 2007, the police asked him to describe what the man was wearing. In a statement he signed, he wrote, He did not notice the body clothing and cannot describe the colour or fashion of the same. By January, eight months later, he was able to say, The man was wearing beige trousers and darkish top, maybe a jacket or blazer. To our knowledge, neither Martin Smith nor his two children in May 2007 could remember what the man was wearing above his waist. Peter Smith said that he also does not remember the clothing the individual wore or his shoes. His younger sister, Ifa Smith, said that she did not see what he was wearing above his trousers, as the child covered him almost completely at the top. So it is interesting that Martin Smith claimed over eight months later that the man was wearing a darkish top, maybe a jacket or blazer. I'm now going to look at the extraordinary claim made by Martin Smith over four months after he first reported his sighting. On the 20th of September, he phoned Leicestershire Police. This time he made the claim that the man he had seen over four months ago may have been Jerry McCann. Let's see how this development came about. Why did he think this? 
because, he said, he had seen Jerry McCann on his return to England on the 9th of September on a TV news bulletin, walking down the steps of his plane carrying his son Sean on his left shoulder. And how did that enable him to say it was Jerry McCann that he saw back on the 3rd of May? Gonchalo Amaral supplies an answer in his book. It was, quote, that way of carrying his child, that way of walking. So it was the way Jerry McCann was carrying his son Sean down the steps of the plane that made his mind go back and think it probably was Jerry McCann that he saw. Remember, he saw the man for a second or two in the dark over four months ago. When carrying a child who is asleep or very tired, a natural way to carry your child, if you have no buggy or pushchair, is on one's shoulder. The twins were just two and a half years old. It's normal for passengers with an infant that age to carry their child down steep aircraft steps on their shoulder. And it appears that Martin Smith didn't inform the police immediately he saw the news broadcast. The evidence suggests that he waited several days before doing so, 11 days in fact, as Leicestershire police records seem to show that Smith made the call on the 20th of September. He added that he was 60 to 80 percent sure it was Jerry McCann, based, it seems, on the way he was carrying his infant son on his shoulder. Gonchalo Amaral was told the news. He made provisional arrangements to interview Martin Smith again. But on the 2nd of October, he was taken off the investigation by the Chief of Police and replaced by Paolo Rabello. And there the matter rested until the McCann team began contacting Martin Smith and his family, probably around December 2007. And as I will show in a moment, very soon, the McCann team began placing significance on the Smith man sighting. Given that Martin Smith had been 60 to 80 percent sure in September that he had really seen Jerry McCann that night in May, that seems like a remarkable turnaround. I should also mention here another statement to be found in the police files, of a sighting by a couple in the early hours of the 5th of May, just over 24 hours after Madeline was reported missing. This alleged sighting was in Alvor, about 10 miles east of Praia de Luz. They say they saw a white van which pulled up in the middle of the road. A man got out carrying a child and staggered up a bank in a drunken manner. Soon after, they saw a woman who appeared worried. One of the witnesses, Richard McCluskey, after giving his initial statement to the police on the 9th of May, contacted the police again four months later in September to give a second statement, in which he said, I have watched a good deal of news coverage about the McCanns over the past week or so. Another thing which has played on my mind is the coverage of Mr. McCann walking off the aeroplane holding one of his young children. The way he was holding the child over his left shoulder reminded me of the man carrying the child from the white van in Portugal. There is a great deal of coincidence with regards this sighting and the Smith sighting. Both Richard McCluskey and Martin Smith gave statements of a man carrying a child. McCluskey's statement was taken four days after his sighting. Smith's was reported 13 days after his sighting. They both gave a voluntary second statement in mid-September which implicated Jerry McCann and they both made these new statements because of the way Jerry McCann was carrying his child on his left shoulder off the plane. We are surely entitled to ask, was someone feeding them a script? I will mention here that I am aware that a significant number of people believe that Smith Man was indeed Jerry McCann and you are perhaps wondering why I am not making more of this possibility. Well, I don't rule that out. But bear in mind, the Smith sighting is extremely similar to the very suspect Tanner sighting. I have also seen evidence which suggests to me that Madeline may have died on or around the 29th of April. If this is true, it is unlikely that Jerry McCann four days later, would walk down a public street with his daughter's corpse for everyone to see. I hope to highlight this evidence in another film. Before I move on, I just want to deal with one report that surfaced in the Daily Mirror on the 16th of October 2013. Just two days after the BBC Crime Watch McCann special, which I am going to examine later on, it claimed that Martin Smith had tried to talk to the Portuguese police early on, but that they were not interested in his sighting. 
The report included several quotes from Martin Smith. Here are some extracts from the Mirror's report. A key witness in the Madeleine McCann case claimed yesterday that Portuguese police failed to take his evidence seriously. Mr Smith, a former Unilever executive, made a statement along with his wife Mary, daughter Eva and son Peter soon after Madeleine vanished on the 3rd of May 2007. Retired businessman Martin Smith, 64, provided details for an efit of the prime suspect after spotting the mystery man carrying a child at 10pm, close to where the three-year-old vanished more than six years ago. But he said his information was virtually ignored by local officers because they were too busy chasing up another sighting of a man near Kate and Jerry McCann's holiday apartment in Prior de Luz 45 minutes earlier. Scotland Yard detectives reinvestigating the case after six years have now established that the suspect Portuguese police were so keen to trace, spotted by holidaymaker Jane Tanner at 9.20pm, was just an innocent British tourist returning with his own child from a creche. This article is misleading by suggesting that the Portuguese police took details from the Smiths for an e-fit, yet went on to ignore this. It was also misleading in suggesting that the police were too busy chasing up the sighting of another man, namely Tanaman. In fact, the Portuguese police were suspicious of Tanner's claimed sighting from day one, which is why they waited over three weeks before even publicising it to the public. And even then, they did so only after the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Gordon Brown, leaned heavily on the Portuguese authorities to do so. Besides that, we know from Dr Amaral's book that as soon as the Smiths did get around to mentioning their sighting, the Portuguese police reacted swiftly and invited them over to take their statements. The Mirror report is in many respects false. Like many other mainstream media reports in this case, this false claim was probably, like so many other Madeleine McCann stories, supplied by the McCann's public relations spokesman, Clarence Mitchell. I want to go back just for a moment to look at a very curious development in the case just after Robert Murat was made a suspect. He was made a suspect on Tuesday the 15th of May. Within 24 hours of Murat being named as the chief suspect, three separate members of the McCann's group of friends, the Tapas Seven, Rachel Oldfield, Russell O'Brien and Fiona Payne, all made separate statements to the Portuguese police claiming they had seen Robert Murat in the vicinity of the Ocean Club around the time Madeline disappeared. They even stuck to their story when all three of them were summoned to a tense head-to-head -head confrontation with Murat in a pokey room in Portimao Police Station on the 11th of July that year. Taken together with a fourth Tapa 7 member, Jane Tanner, having also claimed to be sure that it was Robert Murat she'd seen carrying a child away from the McCann's apartment on the 3rd of May. Was this an organised effort by the McCann team to fit up Murat as the abductor of Madeleine McCann? Was he perhaps the fall guy, the patsy? These are issues I hope to cover in depth in a forthcoming look at the role of Robert Murat in this case. I'm going to conclude my analysis of Smithman with a look at how the McCann team came to bring great significance to the Irish family sighting, as we'll see from quite early on. And then I'll finish off with an in-depth look at how the BBC Crime Watch team back in October 2013 suddenly rescued this sighting from complete obscurity and helped DCI Andy Redwood to make Smithman Scotland Yard's number one suspect. It is an extraordinary story. So far, the Smithman sighting has gone through what I might call three phases. Phase 1, from the 3rd to the 15th of May 2007, an unreported sighting. The Smiths claimed to have seen a man carrying a child, but did not report it. Phase 2, from the 16th of May to the 20th of September 2007, a reported sighting. The Smiths report what they say they saw, and the Portuguese police interview three members of the Smith family. Phase 3, from the 20th of September to December 2007. Could it be Jerry McCann? Martin Smith triggers new interest in the sighting by claiming that he was 60 to 80% sure he really saw Jerry McCann that night in early May. I'm now going to look at what I'm calling Phase 4. January 2008 to November 2008. The McCanns take over the Smith sighting. 
To see how Phase 4 developed and how the McCanns and their team got involved, we need to go back and look at the press coverage in the first week of January 2008. The news of the McCann team's involvement with the Smithman sighting was first broken by Rupert Murdoch's son and the Daily Mail and Mirror on the 3rd of January 2008. The Sun report told us, Private detectives hunting the Madeleine McCann case are to quiz an Irish family who may have been the last to see her alive. Martin Smith, his wife and children, told cops they saw a man carrying a little blonde girl in Pride Luz on the night Maddie vanished. Investigators from the Matodo 3 agency, hired by Maddie's parents, Jerry and Kate, are preparing to travel to Ireland to interview them. Mr Smith, who has already spoken to Portuguese cops over the sighting, said yesterday, I'd talk to anyone to move this investigation on. I think about Maddie every day, he added. I found the Portuguese cops not to be the most efficient bunch. The Mirror report added this detail. The McCann spokesman said yesterday, Our detectives are being very methodical, and I am quite sure that this family will be on their list. We learned from that article that the investigators were from Matodo 3. In my earlier film, Buried by Mainstream Media, I showed what a disreputable agency Matodo 3 were. I also explained that the entire McCann private investigation team was run by Cheshire businessman Brian Kennedy. Mark Hollingsworth, who writes for the Evening Standard, wrote about the McCann's private investigations and is alleged to have said that key witnesses were questioned far too aggressively by Kennedy's investigators, so much so that some of them later refused to talk to police. The claim in the Mirror report that the Matodo three men were being very methodical was laughable. This was the outfit whose boss, Francisco Marco, had lied by boasting that Madeline was alive and that his men knew where she was and were closing in on the kidnappers and finally promised that Maddie would be home by Christmas. By the end of the month, Brian Kennedy had indeed made contact with the Smiths because of a letter sent on the 30th of January by Detective Sergeant Liam Hogan of the Garda Detective Branch in Drogheda to the Portuguese police. Hogan wrote, he has been contacted by numerous tabloid press looking for stories. He has been contacted by Mr. Brian Kennedy, who is supporting the McCann family, to take part in a photo fit exercise. He added, I do not believe that Martin Smith is courting the press. In my view, he is a genuine person. He is known locally and is a very decent person. What happened next in this story is shrouded in mystery. Martin Smith, to our knowledge, has said nothing publicly about it. The McCann team have said almost nothing. Most of what we know comes from a former top MI5 man. What we can distill from what little we know is the following. In April 2008, a company called Oakley International, headed by fraudster Kevin Halligan, took over most of the McCann team investigation from Matodo 3. After working for the McCanns for barely four months and pocketing nearly £600,000 for his work for the team, Halligan went on the run from the police until October 2009 when he was finally run to ground in a £700 a night Oxfordshire hotel and taken to Belmarsh Top Security Prison to await extradition to the US on a $2 million fraud charge. He was found guilty and served over four years in prison. Halligan employed as his right-hand man a man from Bury, Lancashire, called Henry Exton. Exton was the former head of MI5's covert intelligence unit, but fell from grace when he got a criminal record for stealing a bottle of perfume from Manchester Airport. The Sunday Times recently told us that Henry Exton, sometime during 2008, maybe together with others, visited the Smiths. We don't know where or when this mysterious meeting took place, but... Doing the best we can, we can place the visit at some time between April and October 2008, most probably in the spring. What we also know on the record from him and the McCanns is that during this period he produced two e-fits. These were the ones shown on BBC Crime Watch in October 2013 and were then described as the central focus of the Scotland Yard investigation. Henry Exton, the McCanns, and now Scotland Yard are all united behind the claim that the Smith family produced these two efits. I am sceptical of this, and in a moment I will explain why. 
But first, let's move to what I am calling Phase 5 of the Smith sighting. January to May 2009, Smith Man features in a Pro McCann documentary. Shortly after Kevin Halligan and his team were sacked in disgrace by the McCann team, Brian Kennedy appointed local man and former detective inspector Dave Edgar to lead the investigation. This was around November 2008. Some weeks later, another retired police officer, former Detective Sergeant Arthur Cowley, who lived in a cottage high up on Halgan Mount in Wales, was appointed to join him. Ostensibly, these two men were appointed to look for Madeline. But in reality, it seems that they spent much of their time preparing for a very significant documentary on the Madeline McCann case, produced by Mentone Media in association with Channel 4. It was this documentary that the McCanns used to promote their suggestion that Jane Tanner's Tanner Man and the Smith family's Smith Man might be the very same person. How likely was it that a man seen with an abducted child by Jane Tanner at 9.15pm could be seen 45 minutes later, less than half a mile away, still carrying the abducted child? Not only were Tanner Man and Smith Man linked in the documentary, there were two separate discussions in the film about this possibility. During the documentary, three other sightings of suspicious-looking men were also discussed, as well as Tanner Man and Smith Man. The most likely sighting of Madeleine and her abductor was by Jane Tanner, a friend of the McCanns. In the files, Kate believes another witness statement from an Irish family describes a very similar sighting to Jane's, less than a mile from the McCanns' apartment. The reason why this is significant is both sightings were given independently. So when this family gave their statement, they weren't aware of Jane's description. And there's actually quite a lot of similarities. And it does beg the question, I mean, how many people carry the children on a cold night not covered, you know, nothing on their arms or the feet, no blanket? Now, either there's been two people carrying children in that way, who haven't come forward to eliminate themselves, or potentially they're related. But you think that child is Madeline? I think there's a good chance it could be Madeline. Certainly the, the description there sounds to me like Madeline. Kate and the Fine Madeline campaign coordinator travel to the search team's offices. They want to discuss the details of the upcoming reconstructions and three potentially key witness statements that all tell of a man hanging round the McCann's apartment in the days leading up to May the 3rd, 2007. The most important ones, apart from the obvious of Jane, is side number th three, the, the man in the uh, alouette at the back of the apartment. So it, it number three de is definitely a very important statement because it links them. The investigators have examined the statements from the three different witnesses and are now convinced that prior to Madeline's abduction, the McCanns were being watched. Okay. The, the team hope this new information will give them the breakthrough they need. You'd think it's got to be the same person, wouldn't you, yeah. really? Uh, and all three say that he, he was watching the apartment. Yeah. We're here to discuss the, the pending reconstruction that we want done. So basically it looks like we've got five sightings really, two a man with a child and three yeah. just a suspicious individual. Yeah. At the beginning of this discussion, Kate McCann introduces a very important idea. She says both sightings were given independently. But what did Gonchalo Amaral say in his book? The Smiths learn that, according to Jane Tanner's statements, Marat is definitely the man encountered on the night of the abduction. Mr Smith then gets in touch with the Irish police to relate what he saw on the night of May the 3rd. Were they working from the same script? Let's now look at the second time Smithman comes up in this documentary. It is possible that Jane Tanner is not the only person who saw Madeline being carried away by the abductor. Forty minutes after Jane's sighting, and half a mile away from the McCann's apartment, a family also saw a man carrying a young girl away from the town. Later, 
The witness thought that this might have been Jerry McCann, but this was investigated and ruled out by the Portuguese police. A man was seen here carrying a child just before 10 p.m. on the night Madeline was abducted. When the man saw the family, he appeared furtive and veered off to one side and, and carried on walking. But obviously, anyone carrying a child that night, it's, it's really important. We need to find out who this person was. I was with my family. We'd been out for the night and we were walking up this street when I saw a man and he was carrying a child. I thought they were father and daughter, so I wasn't so suspicious. The girl was about four. She looked like my granddaughter. Blonde hair, pale white skin, typically British. The man didn't look like a tourist. I can't explain why. It was probably from his clothes. Someone knows the information, and someone knows who took Madeline, and someone knows where she is. Let's get moving. Let's get the phone ringing. The first thing to note about this statement is Dave Edgar's spin on what the Smith family say about their sightings. He says, the man appeared furtive and veered off to one side. To our knowledge, the Smiths in their statements do not say he appeared furtive, nor veered off to one side. He appears to have misled the viewers. Secondly, the family witness statement that is read out by the narrator is not a direct reading from Martin Smith's statement. It is selective and edited. Third, despite Martin Smith's statement back in September 2007 to claim that Jerry McCann was probably the man he'd seen on that dark night in May, this is now curtly dismissed by the narrator, who says the witness thought that this might have been Jerry McCann, but this was investigated and ruled out by the Portuguese police. The efits said to have been created by the Smiths during 2008 were not shown in this documentary. Why not? If the McCann team believed that these efits were drawn up by the Smiths, as they had apparently been told by ex-MI5 investigator Henry Exton, why were they not shown to all the viewers back in May 2009? That's not an easy question to answer, but let's try with the help of a curiously worded apology published by the Sunday Times in December 2013. What was this apology and how did it come about? The BBC Crime Watch programme, which we'll examine shortly, went out on the 14th of October 2013. The EFITs, apparently produced by Henry Exton, were the highlight of the entire broadcast. Exton, it seems, was incensed and complained to the Sunday Times. Here's part of the original Sunday Times article, published on the 27th of October, less than two weeks after the Crime Watch McCann special. Madeline Clues hidden for five years. The new prime suspect was first singled out by detectives in 2008. Their findings were suppressed. The critical new evidence at the centre of Scotland Yard's search for Madeleine McCann was kept secret for five years after it was presented to her parents by ex-MI5 investigators. The evidence was in fact taken from an intelligence report produced for Jerry and Kate McCann by a firm of former spies in 2008. It contained crucial efits of a man seen carrying a child on the night of Madeline's disappearance, which have only this month become public after he was identified as the prime suspect by Scotland Yard. A team of hand-picked former MI5 agents had been hired by the McCanns to chase a much-needed breakthrough in the search for their missing daughter Madeline. A report produced by the investigators was deemed hypercritical of the McCanns and their friends, and the authors were threatened with legal action if it was made public. Its contents remained secret until Scotland Yard detectives conducting a fresh review of the case contacted the authors and asked for a copy. They found that it contained new evidence about a key suspect seen carrying a child away from the McCanns' holiday apartment on the night Madeline disappeared. This sighting is now considered the main lead in the investigation. 
Efits taken from the report were the centrepiece of a Crime Watch appeal that attracted more than 2,400 calls from the public this month. One of the investigators, Henry Exton, whose work was sidelined, said last week he was utterly stunned when he watched the programme and saw the evidence his team had passed to the McCanns five years ago presented as a breakthrough. Exton said they had focused on the Smith sighting, travelling to Ireland to interview the family and producing efits of the man they saw. Their report said the Smiths were helpful and sincere and concluded the Smith sighting as credible evidence of a sighting of Maddie. Their report was delivered to the McCanns in November 2008. This report by the Sunday Times Insight team was very clear. Exton was saying that the Smiths were credible people. They helped him to draw up two efits. The McCanns knew about these efits before November 2008 and were handed a report about the efits in November 2008. Yet, said the Sunday Times, the McCanns had done nothing about it for a whole five years. It was a serious accusation, much too serious for the McCanns to ignore. They sued the Sunday Times for what they said was a gross libel of them. This led to a small and very curiously worded apology printed some weeks later by the Sunday Times. Let's now look at exactly what it said. In articles dated October 27, Madeline Clues Hidden for Five Years and Investigators Had EFITS Five Years Ago, we referred to EFITS which were included in a report prepared by private investigators for the McCanns and the Fund in 2008. We accept that the articles may have been understood to suggest that the McCanns had withheld information from the authorities. This was not the case. We now understand and accept that the EFITS had been provided to the Portuguese and Leicestershire police by October 2009. This apology was not enough for the McCanns. They carried on with their libel action, eventually forcing the Sunday Times to pay them £55,000 damages, plus of course their legal costs. The one factual statement we are interested in is this. The McCanns claim that they provided these EFITS to the Portuguese and Leicestershire police by October 2009. Exton, as quoted in the Sunday Times, said he handed the report to the McCanns in November 2008. No doubt he would have told them about the EFITS as soon as he had produced them much earlier in the year. After all, the McCanns were paying him and the serial fraudster Kevin Halligan for his work. The McCanns say they provided the EFITS to the Portuguese police. Why have they not given us the actual date they did this? The same applies to their claim to have handed these EFITs to Leicestershire Police. On what date did they do this? It seems they haven't told us. Also, the Times uses the curious phrase that they sent these EFITs by October 2009. This could mean anything. It could mean that they sent them a year earlier. Or it could mean that they waited until the last day of October 2009 to do so. Why do we not get a clear, open answer from them? What we can draw from this is that the McCanns may indeed have sat on these EFITs, that is, withheld them from the police for about 18 months. The EFITs were probably produced in around April 2008, but only by October 2009, 18 months later, it seems, had they provided these EFITs to the two police forces. Why did they delay passing this apparently vital information to the police at all? So what happened to the two EFITs after they handed them in to the police? If they were handed to the Portuguese police and Leicestershire police as claimed, neither police force deemed them worthy of consideration. They did nothing, and neither did the McCanns. The next thing we know about the EFITs is the McCanns claim that the EFITs were passed to Operation Grange, the Scotland Yard team reviewing the Madeleine McCann case shortly after it was set up in May 2011. My next task is to explain why the head of Operation Grange, Detective Chief Inspector Andy Redwood, also did nothing with these EFITs until they were presented to an audience of some 7 million people on the BBC Crime Watch McCann special some two and a half years later. Why a further delay of two and a half years? I will explain this in a moment, but first let's get back to our general theme of how the McCanns have made use of the Smith sighting. So far, I have identified five phases of the Smith man sighting, 
Here they are again, now to phases 6 and 7. Phase 6 of the Smith sighting ran from June 2009 to April 2011. This is the period during which the McCanns actively promoted the Smith sighting on their Find Madeline website. Then, when Dr. Kate McCann published her book Madeline on the 11th of May 2011, Phase 7 began, the further promotion of Smith Man sighting on seven pages of her book. Let's now briefly examine these two phases. The sighting by an Irish family was uploaded to the McCann's Find Madeline website immediately after the 2009 Channel 4 documentary. An Irish voice was heard explaining the sighting with the following words. I was with my family. We'd been out for the night. After leaving a bar, we took the back way up some steps. We turned off this street and up another street. I'm not sure of its name. We were walking up this street when I saw a man and he was carrying a child. I thought they were father and daughter, so I wasn't so suspicious. He was walking down the street in the opposite direction to us. The girl was about four. She looked like my granddaughter. Blonde hair, pale white skin, typically British. The man didn't look like a tourist. I can't explain why. It was probably from his clothes. I only really saw the man when we passed each other. He was white, about 175 or 1.8 metres tall, perhaps 34 or 35 years old. He was slim to normal build with short brown hair. He didn't wear glasses, moustache or a beard. I can't recall what he was wearing apart from a pair of beige trousers. The girl was wearing light coloured pyjamas. She was uncovered, no blanket or throw. Some of my family remember her having bare feet. He was carrying the girl over his arms with her head against his left shoulder. He looked a bit uncomfortable in the way he carried her. This followed the wording of Martin Smith's initial statement very closely, except for one curious thing. In his witness statement, he had said that the man was about 35 to 40 years old. Now this statement says he was perhaps 34 or 35 years old. Why is the age more precise? This new estimate of the man's age as 34 to 35 also appears in Kate McCann's book two years later. We can see here that Martin Smith's original statement has been adapted, maybe to make it appear more credible. We wonder how much did Martin Smith actively cooperate in the making of this Channel 4 documentary and his message being put on the McCann's website. He was and is a potential witness in this case. He must presumably have been asked for permission to place his sighting on the McCann's website. Was he asked to allow the documentary makers to change his statement about the man's age from 35 to 40 to 34 to 35? If so, when did Martin Smith agree to this? Why was the statement changed and who made the decision to change it? These are important questions which remain unanswered. What would happen if he was put in the witness box and a barrister put this to him? Mr. Smith, you told the police the man you saw was 35 to 40 years old. Why and when did you change your mind about this? So we've had a look at phase 6. Now what about phase 7? The further promotion of the Smith Man sighting on seven pages of Kate McCann's book. If we look through Kate McCann's book, we see several clear references to Smith Man. Page 98. We subsequently learned that less than 50 minutes after Jane's sighting, when I still had to discover that Madeline was missing, a family of nine from Ireland had also seen a man carrying a child, this time on Rua de Escola Primaria, a few minutes' walk from apartment 5A, heading towards Rua 25 de Abro. Their description was remarkably similar to Jane's. The man was in his mid-thirties, 1.75 to 1.8 metres tall, and of slim to normal build. These witnesses, too, said this person didn't look like a tourist. They felt it might have been because of what he was wearing. They also mentioned cream or beige trousers. The child, a little girl about four, with medium blonde hair, lying with her head towards the man's left shoulder. She was wearing light-coloured pyjamas, had nothing on her feet, and there was no blanket over her. The man did not look comfortable carrying the child, as if he wasn't used to it. In this short paragraph, Kate calls the two descriptions remarkably similar, and mentions as many as 11 distinct similarities. It is clear that Kate is suggesting that Smith Man was a genuine sighting, and probably the same man seen by Jane Tanner. Again on pages 328 and 329, Smith Man is referred to, and Kate now suggests it is the same man. Quote, 
Who knows why there was a 45 minute gap between the two sightings, or where this man might have been in between. I have long ago stopped trying to come up with answers, because I don't think I need to. If the child was Madeline, and in four years no father has ever come forward to say it was him and his daughter, why would we assume that he was behaving normally or logically? There is nothing normal about stealing a little girl from her bed, so why should his subsequent actions be predictable? She goes on to speculate. The abductor would hardly have been expecting to see Jane walking towards him as he escaped, let alone have anticipated that Jerry would be standing talking around the corner. Whatever plan was in his mind, he might very well have been forced by these near misses to change it pretty quickly. Then finally, on pages 370 to 372, we get a direct comparison from Kate between Jane Tanner's Tannerman and Martin Smith's Smithman. Kate McCann is right to say that the similarities are striking. The only description that differs significantly is in the colour and the length of the man's hair. There is one curious statement she makes in her book, though, page 371. She says that Jane saw a man 5 foot 10 in height, 1.78 metres, making the man the same height as Smith man. But if you look at Tanner's statement, it indicates that the man was only 1.7 metres tall, which would make him only 5 foot 7. Why the change of about 3 inches? Kate says in her book, the man's height was recorded incorrectly in her, meaning Jane Tanner's statement. How does she know this? So we have seen in phases 6 and 7 how the McCanns made significance of the Smith man sighting. People bought her book and read about Smithman. People kept visiting the McCann's website and heard the Irish family's account of the sighting. But now we move on to the most vital new phase in the development of the Smith sighting. Phase 8. Operation Grange gets the Smithman e-fits and spends over six months planning a BBC programme to promote them. We know, as it's been admitted by the McCanns and Operation Grange, that very early on in the history of Operation Grange, the McCanns handed the EFITs to the senior investigating officer, DCI Andy Redwood. Operation Grange, based at Belgravia Police Station, was set up in May 2011, when Prime Minister David Cameron was pressurised by Rebecca Brooks, the chief executive officer of Rupert Murdoch's News International Empire, to set it up. We can assume that DCI Redwood had these two EFITs by the summer of 2011. One news report said it was August 2011. They were finally shown to the British public on a BBC Crime Watch show on the 14th of October 2013. Over two years later, why the delay? I suggest two reasons. First, DCI Redwood couldn't use the Smithman EFITs until he had solved the problems created by the sighting by Jane Tanner. There were two main problems with it. It was not credible. There were numerous indications that it was fabricated. And, as we've just seen, how could you possibly explain a man walking around a small town for 45 minutes with a child you've just abducted? You couldn't. The second reason for the delay could be that he may have needed to have Martin Smith's cooperation with any broadcast about him on Crime Watch, especially as the Crime Watch McCann special was to be the most hyped Crime Watch show ever. We know on the record that DCI Redwood had two interviews with Martin Smith, one in 2012 and one in 2013, as the Crime Watch program was being planned. We don't know if these meetings took place by DCI Redwood going to Ireland or Martin Smith flying to London. We don't know if any other members of the Smith family were present at these two meetings. What we can be almost sure about is that DCI Redwood would have discussed with Martin Smith the two efforts he now had in his possession, and one would assume Redwood would have shared with Martin Smith exactly what he was going to say about the Smith sighting on the Crime Watch programme. Strangely, although DCI Redwood made a huge deal of the EFITs and made reference to the sighting by an Irish family, he did not actually say on Crime Watch that the Smiths produced the EFITs. I'll come to that in a moment.
Back in July 2008, when Dr. Amaral published his book, The Truth of the Lie, he was persuaded that the Smiths had honestly described their sighting. He also tended to believe Martin Smith when he claimed to have recognised Jerry McCann as possibly the man he'd seen carrying a child on the 3rd of May. But now we've seen how the McCann team became involved and how by the first few months of 2009 they were already making use of the sighting. Then in 2011, in her book, we saw how in a number of sections of her book Madeline, she openly suggested that the men Jane Tanner and Martin Smith said they saw were one and the same. Smithman was being actively used by the McCann team. Conchalo Amaral had believed that Smithman might well be Jerry McCann, but now the McCanns were strongly suggesting he was the abductor. And now we move on to consider the last phase of Smithman. Phase 9, October 2013, Smithman revealed by Scotland Yard as the chief suspect. Let's now look at the relevant part of the transcript of the BBC Crime Watch McCann special on the 14th of October 2013. Madeline and her siblings, Sean and Emily, were staying in the front bedroom which looked out onto the front car park. Um, Madeline was in a bed and the two children were in travel cots um, between, between Madeline's bed and the bed that was nearest to the window. The careful and critical analysis of the timeline has been absolutely key. Primarily, we're focused on the area between 8.30 and 10. We know that at 8.30, that was the time that Mr. and Mrs. McCann went down to the tapas area for their dinner, and we know that at around 10 p.m., that was when Mrs. McCann found that Madeline was missing. One of the most pivotal events on the timeline was Jane Tanner's sighting of a man carrying a child. He was walking in this spot, just metres from where Madeline had been sleeping. This man was widely thought to be Madeline's abductor, but the team was taking nothing for granted. One of the things that we picked up very quickly was the fact that there was a night crash that was operating from the main Ocean Club reception and eight families had left 11 children in there and one particular family we spoke to gave us information that was really interesting and exciting. In fact, I would say it was, a, it was a revelation moment when having discussed with them what they were doing on the night, they themselves believed that they could be the Tanner sighting. The British father had collected his two-year-old daughter from the crash. He had been walking near the McCann's apartment. This is the actual photograph taken by Metropolitan Police officers of the man dressed in the kind of clothes he wore on holiday. This image was compared to the artist's impression. It is uncannily similar. And we know the pajamas that their child was wearing, that it is, again, uncannily striking, the similarity. So what you're saying is that the timeline that everyone was working on for years in this case was wrong. We're almost certain now that this sighting is not the abductor. But very importantly, what it says is that from 9.15, we're able to allow the clock to continue to move forward. And in doing so, things that have not been quite as significant or received quite the same degree of attention are now the center of our focus. This was an enormous discovery for the team, an innocent explanation for the suspect who'd been at the center of the case for six years. Their attention quickly turned to another sighting, which could now be the key to the entire mystery. It was here at 10 p.m. that an Irish family witnessed another man carrying a child. They saw him come down the hill from the direction of the Ocean Club, heading that way towards the beach. Could this have been Madeline and her abductor? So, Redwood had effectively claimed to the British nation that he had traced, identified and eliminated the chief suspect, Tanner Mann. He was almost certain, he told Crime Watch viewers. What now? Then, as we saw, Redwood came up with another bombshell. His chief suspect was now Smith Mann, the man the Irish family said they had seen. And he produced two efits of the suspect. Here they are. But when Crime Watch showed us these two efits, 
Redwood appears to have been guilty of some cunning sleight of hand. Let's just listen carefully to the actual words used on Crime Watch. It was here at 10 p.m. that an Irish family witnessed another man carrying a child. They saw him come down the hill from the direction of the Ocean Club, heading that way towards the beach. Could this have been Madeline and her abductor? He was a white man with brown hair, and the child that he had in his arms was described as being about three to four years of age with blonde hair, possibly wearing pyjamas, a description very close to that of Madeleine McCann. Two of the witnesses helped create efits of the man they saw. Today, for the first time, we can reveal the true significance of these images. This could be the man that took Madeline, but very importantly, there could be an innocent explanation. The efits are clear. Notice that presenter Amrila Walla does not actually say that these two efit images were produced by the Smith family. He refers, for some reason, only to the two witnesses. Then he says that the two efits of the man are clear. But most people who have looked at these two images suggest that they look to be images of two entirely different people. Moreover, computer experts have analysed the two images and consider that the two images have been produced on different EFIT computer programmes. One image is grainy, the other is sharper. If they were, as claimed, drawn up by two members of the Smith family, why do they look like they were generated using different software? But still more relevant, why, if we are looking for just one man, do we get two images which, to most people, look like quite different blokes? The man on the left, when compared to the man on the right, has a fat face, has a rectangular shaped face, the man on the right has a triangular shaped face, his curly hair brushed back, unlike the crew cut of the man on the right, he has thicker lips, has a shortish, flattish nose compared with the long, thin nose of the man on the right. It is highly unusual for the police to show two different efforts of one man they are really looking for. It's even more unusual for a pair of efforts to reveal so many different features. Why did the police not get the Smiths to come up with one composite efit of the man they said they desperately wanted to trace? But on top of that is the question of how an efit could have been constructed, bearing in mind the Smiths' initial statements. They only saw him for a few seconds, it was dark, the street lighting was weak, they all said that the child covered the man's face, so they couldn't see what he looked like. Each of them told the police explicitly that they would not be able to recognise the man if they saw him again. Here are the statements made by each of the Smiths about the man they said they saw. He did not wear glasses and had no beard or moustache. He did not notice any other relevant details, partly due to the fact that the lighting was not very good. He did not notice the body clothing and cannot describe the colour or fashion of the same. It is not possible for him to recognise the individual in person or by photograph. He does not remember if he wore glasses or had a beard or moustache. He did not notice any other relevant details as the lighting was bad. He also does not remember the clothing the individual wore or his shoes. He states that he did not notice those details. What we had seen was so vague that we couldn't identify the guy. At the time we saw his face, but now cannot remember it. She thinks that he had a clean-shaven face. States that probably she would not be able to recognise either the individual or the child. Bearing in mind these statements, how could any efits realistically have been produced? In my email to Martin Smith on the 21st of January 2015, I wrote, Dear Martin, I am continuing to research the events surrounding the Madeleine McCann case and I would like to ask you if you would do an interview for a possible TV film. I am led to believe that the efits which were featured on Crime Watch UK in October 2013 were both derived from yours and or members of your family's descriptions of the man you saw. There is some confusion about these efits, not least the fact that they were never released until five years after they were produced. Would you be willing to be interviewed just to clear up what the sequence of events was after you had the sighting? If you are unable to do an interview, can you tell me in an email, one, who asked you to do the EFITs, two, which organisation drew the EFITs, three, when were the two EFITs done and were they done at the same time and place, 
4. Which person in your family was the witness for each of the efits? 5. Did you expect the efits to be made public when you made them? 6. Did you think it strange that they were not made public? To date, I have had no response from Martin Smith. Now let's move on to consider the blurry image of the man allegedly found by DCI Andy Redwood, the man said to be carrying a child home from the crash. the man, so DCI Redwood told Crime Watch viewers, who was the man Jane Tanner really saw. The first point we might ask is, where had he been for the last six and a half years? He was allegedly in Prior de Luz at the time. He must have been fully aware of all the publicity about Madeline. He must have known that Jane Tanner had claimed to have seen a man carrying a child near apartment 5A at exactly 9.15pm. He probably saw, or was at least aware of, all the documentaries about Madeline, all the news items, the TV interviews by the McCanns on such programmes as Oprah Winfrey and Piers Morgan. To say the least, this raises a major question about the validity of DCI Redwood's claims about this unnamed man suddenly having come forward after six and a half years. Let's look back for a moment exactly what the Crime Watch programme told us about this man who'd suddenly contacted DCI Redwood. One particular family we spoke to gave us information that they themselves believed that they could be the Tanner sighting. The British father had collected his two-year-old daughter from the crash. He had been walking near the McCann's apartment. Crime Watch also told us that in the blurred photograph of him, the man was dressed in the kind of clothes he wore on holiday. Not only that, but we were told that his two-year-old daughter was wearing pyjamas that were uncannily, strikingly similar. The coincidences are simply amazing. But let's also consider this. DCI Redwood speaks of a family being on holiday. It's reasonable to assume that the man's wife or partner, the child's mother, was with him on holiday. Where was she when this man was allegedly carrying this toddler back to his holiday apartment? Why did he not have a buggy or a pushchair? Why did he not have a coat, blanket or warm outer clothing for the child? We are simply being asked to take on trust from Scotland Yard that this man who comes forward after six and a half years really exists. Do you believe him? There is surely room for doubt, and that doubt was shared publicly by one of the most respected workers with children, child psychologist and former state prosecutor Wendy Murphy, a lady who had studied the Madeleine McCann case in depth. Here she is on Fox News giving her opinion on Scotland Yard's attempts to find yet another mystery abductor in the case. Help solve the mystery of what happened to Madeleine McCann. She, of course, is the three-year-old British girl who disappeared while on vacation more than six years ago. Now Scotland Yard is planning to release a new computerized sketch that shows a possible suspect. Wendy Murphy is a former prosecutor and a child advocate. She joins us now. Hi, Wendy. Good to be with you. Finally, finally, six years later, investigators are releasing a computerized sketch of who they call basically a person of interest, a suspect that people saw around the vacation condo that night. What took them so long? Uh, I hope you don't mind if I duck that question because I'm not buying it. I mean, I think this is more PR than anything. There's, in my opinion, no new suspect, and there will never be a new suspect unless and until the parents answer questions. Remember, Kate McCann, poor Madeline's mom, refused to answer 48 questions now, and Wendy, hired a when team of lawyers right away. Uh, but this is important. She refused right away to answer. Uh, she, she hired lawyers right away, refused to answer 48 questions. Things like, what did you see when you walked into the room where your child was supposed to be sleeping? I mean, I am so not interested in being dragged down a rabbit hole about fake suspects. Now, and I think this is all related to a civil suit now underway in Portugal. The McCann sued the former police chief for defamation. Because he wrote and now this book, Kate wants this, this alleged tell-all book. Yes. Wendy, hold on. Let me tell you the other side of this. Because there's a lot of evidence on the side of the parents being completely innocent as well. They say that the Portuguese police never took the case seriously. 
closely. They never did the kind of investigation that we certainly would have done here in the United States, which is talking to other people at the vacation, uh, at the, where, where they were vacationing in Portugal. Furthermore, Kate and Jerry, the parents, have appealed to their country's prime minister, David Cameron, for help on this investigation. Is that something you do if you're trying to stay under the radar and you feel guilty? Do you hire the nation's biggest defense attorneys, PR firms, and refuse to answer questions? The Portuguese police did a very good job, and the PR misinformation, especially in this country, is doing a disservice to this poor little girl who is dead, I believe, and has no voice. The libel suit currently underway in Portugal is important because the McCann sued that ex-police chief, claiming he lied about them in his book. Now Kate McCann wants to testify in writing because she doesn't want to submit to cross-examination. I think this is all related to that, and this all we have a new suspect thing is part of them again trying to distract attention from the fact that as parents of a missing, probably dead child, what are you doing not answering questions? Crashman served Scotland Yard's purposes. They had got rid of the embarrassing sighting by Jane Tanner, widely regarded as fabricated. Now they had got that out of the way, they could change the window of time during which the alleged abduction happened from five minutes to more like 50 minutes. And they had a brand new abductor, Smith Man. But in this film, we've traced this series of four alleged abductors and found all four with inconsistencies. First, we considered Sagres Man. We showed that the claim by Nuno Lorenko that Krakowski, on holiday from Poland for a week, had tried to snatch his daughter lacked credibility. It seemed he couldn't recall on what date it was supposed to have happened, and he didn't bother telling the police about it for days. We exposed the attempt to suggest that the McCanns were also in Sagres, and that Krakowski had seen Madeleine there as no more than a media invention, completely unsubstantiated. Then we saw the evidence that Jane Tanner's statement may have been fabricated and seemingly based on the same description that Nuno Lorenko gave about Krakowski. Next we saw that the sighting of Smith Man by the Irish family had numerous problems, not least why it took so long to report their sighting and the later enhancements to the sightings made by them or by others. Finally we have examined the unlikely Crash Man which is a tale full of improbability and the most unlikely coincidences. Only one of these men has been proven to be real, and that is Sagres Man, the man described by Nuno Lorenko, and he was actually Wojciech Krakowski. Is it possible that Nuno Lorenko, primed by others, deliberately invented a tale about an attempted abduction of his daughter? Is it possible he told his unlikely tale to the Portuguese police on the morning after Jane Tanner described her sighting in order to try to convince the police that there was an abductor? Especially when one considers all the evidence in my previous film, there probably never was an abductor at all. It certainly seems that way. Was the description of Smithman another fabrication, and why was it almost identical to the descriptions of Sagresman and Tanaman? After all, apart from these four alleged abductors, what other evidence of an abduction do we actually have? To my knowledge, there is none. In my previous film, we looked at some of the many contradictions and changes of story surrounding these claims. Apart from what the McCanns themselves say, what actual independent forensic evidence do we have of an abductor? Is there any forensic evidence, footprints, fingerprints, hairs, clothing fibres, DNA, anything in fact. It seems there is none. The only complete fingerprint found on the window was actually that of Kate McCann, suggesting that she may have been the last person to handle the window, sometime shortly before the police were called. Did anyone hear this mystery abductor, maybe lifting the shutters, entering or fleeing the building, the noise of a child, anything at all in fact? Again, absolutely nothing. I'm going to wrap up this film by stating that this video and my previous videos on this case have been made with almost zero funding. I would argue that I have exposed much of the disinformation and got closer to the truth about what really happened. I want you to compare my videos with the information you have seen put out by mainstream media who have got almost limitless resources. 
looking at what I have managed to uncover and put forward in these films as a one-man operation, it should have been fairly straightforward for mainstream media to do the same. It should have been easy for them to carry out investigative journalism and do a similar job to me. But I hope I have fully demonstrated that this is not what mainstream media are about. In fact, I would argue they have helped mislead and therefore hide and bury the true story of Madeleine McCann. Exercises like the Leveson Inquiry are no more than psychological operations to try and show the media are being brought to book. Nothing could be further from the truth. Thank you for watching and please copy and distribute this film freely.